You would think that the hardest part about space travel is getting up to space, but you'd be wrong. Getting back is a much more complicated endeavor. During the early years of space race, a lot of things went sideways, but one of the biggest challenges was the splashdown. As the capsule would decelerate down to Earth, many problems had to be solved, including velocities, lift, and the impact upon landing. But the biggest technical monstrosity, the one that went wrong on most early space flights and was not solved for years, is not what you think. The results of the impact studies that were conducted on humans suggested that some sort of airbag was needed to cushion the landing, but that it might not be sufficient by itself. So there came the pigs, strapped to contour couches and slammed onto the ground while accelerating at up to 58 Gs. To the scientists' surprise, pigs actually withstood far more abuse than anticipated, and thus, NASA only installed an impact skirt on the Mercury spacecraft and just hoped that the astronauts would fare as good as the pigs did. Meet Ham, who received an apple as a reward for going to space. Ham's 16 and a half minute suborbital spaceflight was gentle compared to what happened after he landed. A few miscalculated seconds and the Mercury capsule built up more speed than anticipated during re-entry, which caused the capsule to overshoot the landing area by 130 miles. It took three hours to get to the spacecraft. Meanwhile, Ham had to endure constant rocking and battering by merciless waves. And worse, the capsule was sinking as the heat shield had punched holes in it. By the time Ham was rescued, the capsule had taken about 360 liters of water, which is more than a bathtub full. Ham's torturous splashdown turned things upside down. NASA suddenly realized that the final phase of the mission could prove more dangerous than the space flights themselves. The problem of overshooting the target jumped to the top of the list. Something needed to be done to minimize the recovery time. As a response, the Navy frogmen and an Air Force aircraft were assigned to each mission. Some changes were also made to the capsule. The first American astronaut, Alan Shepard, was launched in a suborbital flight on May 5, 1961. The whole flight took 15 minutes, with the capsule ending up 302 miles from the launch pad. As Shepard braced for impact, he later described it as not that bad and compared it to the jolt of being launched off the catapult of an aircraft carrier. Initially, Shepard was worried that the capsule would start taking on water and that he might need to put his training of escaping a submerged capsule to use. But the recovery helicopter lifted him out of the capsule within minutes of splashdown. Overall, the operation went quite smoothly, but the opposite happened during the second space flight. On July 21, 1961, the second American astronaut, Gus Grissom, splashed down just under three miles away from his target in the Atlantic. As the recovery helicopter approached the capsule, the spacecraft's hatch blew off for unknown reasons. The spacecraft immediately started to sink, and Grissom had no choice but to abandon the capsule. Here comes the crazy part. The helicopter pilot assumed that Grissom's pressure suit would keep him afloat, so he decided to rescue the sinking capsule first instead of recovering Grissom. Ironically, with everything that was going on, Grissom forgot to close the air inlet port of his suit, which in turn started taking on water. Things were not going according to plan. As the helicopter wheels touched the water, Grissom assumed that he was about to be rescued. But instead, the helicopter moved away from him and lifted the capsule out of the water. But then shortly after, cut the capsule loose and the capsule quickly sank to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. As you can imagine, Grissom was furious and watched the whole ordeal in disbelief, trying to process why the pilot would pick up the capsule instead of rescuing him and then drop the capsule. Little did he know that the helicopter had got a warning light indicating that it was about to experience an engine failure since it had exceeded its maximum lifting weight. Everyone was confused. Multiple helicopters just hovered and did nothing. Grissom had a hard time staying afloat. Finally, a helicopter dropped a sling and lifted Grissom out of the water. And if all this already wasn't complicated enough, upon inspection of the helicopter that had dropped the capsule, it turned out that the engine warning light had just malfunctioned. You can't make this stuff up. The sinking of Grissom's capsule was a major blowback to NASA, 
which now had to review its procedures and develop new safeguards. From now on, divers had to be dispatched in the water immediately after the splashdown. Their job was to attach flotation collars around the capsule to prevent it from sinking, even if it was filled with water. A tiny inflatable life vest was also now part of the astronauts' spacesuit. Similar to the first suborbital flight, the first American manned orbital spaceflight went smoothly as John Glenn's Mercury spacecraft landed just 6.8 miles away from the recovery ship. And the second orbital flight was mayhem. The Navy Lieutenant Scott Carpenter nearly ran out of maneuvering fuel as the automatic retrofire system failed to initiate, which forced Carpenter to initiate it manually three seconds later and those three seconds were enough time to cause the spacecraft to splash down 287 miles off target. Carpenter was out of communication range, with no one in sight. He was outside the capsule in his raft when he was located an hour later by an aircraft. Two Navy frogmen joined Carpenter as he snacked on his survival ration, which if you had to guess was made up of Galaxy, Milky Way and Mars bars. We should note that the Navy divers declined when the astronaut offered them his snacks, probably too much sugar. Meanwhile, a debate ensued on who was going to pick up the astronaut. The US Air Force had an HU-16 amphibious aircraft circling the scene, while the primary recovery ship, USS Intrepid, was two hours away. The HU-16 was ordered not to recover the astronaut. So Carpenter kept eating his snacks while the spacecraft and frogmen drifted in the open sea. Three hours after the splashdown, Carpenter was finally recovered by a helicopter from USS Intrepid. The government was not happy with the recovery delay, which resulted in the commander of the recovery forces having to answer some questions. During the last Mercury spaceflight, the problem of overshooting seemed to have been solved, as the last two capsules splashed down only five and one mile away from the target. But it was premature to declare victory just yet. The first manned flight of the Gemini spacecraft was commanded by Gus Grissom, the same astronaut whose capsule sank during the recovery attempt of a Mercury spacecraft. Upon being selected for his second spaceflight, Grissom quickly named the new spacecraft Titanic as a reference to his sunken capsule. But NASA was not a fan of naming a spacecraft after a sunken ship. Eventually, Grissom and NASA settled on the name Molly Brown, a real survivor of the Titanic. Molly Brown splashed down 52 miles away from the target due to incorrect lift calculations. The impact was harsh. Both astronauts were smashed into the capsule's windows, which damaged their faceplates. Grissom also became seasick and had to endure it for the next 30 minutes until Navy frogmen arrived. The Gemini 4 flight experienced the same incorrect calculations and ended up 50 miles off target. The Gemini 5 overshot by 80 miles as a computer programmer made a not-so-trivial mistake of programming a flight computer with the Earth's rotation rate of 360 degrees, while in reality, the actual figure is 360.98. The next major mishap happened during the flight of Gemini 8. Commanded by Neil Armstrong and joined by David Scott, Gemini 8 was on a three-day mission just seven hours into the flight, a thruster malfunction sent the spacecraft into an uncontrollable spin. With Armstrong and Scott nearly passed out, they somehow regained control and executed emergency re-entry. Originally, Gemini 8 was supposed to land in the Atlantic, but due to this emergency, it re-entered the atmosphere on the other side of the world over China and splashed down 621 miles off the shore of Yokosuka, Japan. The recovery response was flawless as the operation began on the first ward of the emergency and the rescue crew took off before the capsule's arrival. Within 45 minutes of landing, the flotation collar was installed and the astronauts were on USS Mason, safe and sound, just three hours after the splashdown. Unlike the Mercury and Gemini spacecraft, Apollo did not experience the problem of overshooting the target. The first mission splashed down within a mile of the target zone. In fact, the landing became so precise that NASA began worrying that the capsule may strike the recovery ship. So mission planners recommended recovery ships to be located at least five miles away from the impact point. From splashing down on the other side of the world to just a few miles away, 
And from striking a ship to safely landing on one, there is no doubt, we have come a long way. And it's not just the big things that went wrong, but the trivial ones and the lessons that we learned from them is what got us here.